morning, so let's, uh, we'll get back into, since we missed last Sunday with the weather and everything, uh, we'll get back into our study on the age of conscience and uh, kind of finish up chapter four that we didn't quite get through. And then I'll be moving on to chapter six after that. And we'll get into the, the pre-flood um, time frame. And so there's sev- several things in this uh, that we can, you know, que- uh, I guess I kind of got it in a, a question form on the, on the outline. Who are the sons of God and who are the daughters of men as we get to chapter six? So we'll be talking about that. Not as extensively as Raymond did, but uh, in his study. But we will we will cover that. So anyway, let's begin our time with a word of prayer, and uh, get right into our study. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, as always, for this new day, this warmer day, and we thank you for the sun shining and and the you know signs of warmer weather and spring around the corner. We look forward to this time of year, Lord, when Things come forth from the ground. And we also look forward to the time of celebrating the resurrection, uh, the day in which Jesus came forth from the ground, out of the grave, and, and re, uh, overcame death and, re, and brought us the hope that we have in him of eternal life. So we thank you for this time of the year that reminds us of those things. and. And we ask you now, Lord, to be with us by the power of your Holy Spirit in our time of study in the book of Genesis. Uh, Guide my teaching. As always, I pray, Lord, that it be true to your word. If if I get off off track a bit, Lord, bring me back. But I, I just pray, Lord, that it can open our minds, open our minds and our thinking and our understanding of your word as we continue to, as best we can, search for your divine agenda and try to understand your agenda from the past through the present into the future and so i thank you for this opportunity i thank you for the people who have come i thank you for the people who will be listening in as well and uh, i just pray that the holy spirit will truly guide us and, and encourage us and direct us and be our teacher i thank you for this time and the people that have come in jesus name amen Okay, where I'm going to pick up on the outline, if you all have the outline, um, page one, we're right, um, we're right kind of down at the third topic, we'll be starting the third topic later this morning, but right before that, I, I have a couple, couple things I want to clarify or or, uh, elaborate on a little bit more. And so I'm going to be talking about this, this word, took, because we, we had it first here in chapter 4 with uh, Lemek, Lemek, um, the offspring or, or, or generations down from, uh, from Cain, in the line of Cain, and he took two wives. But we'll also be looking at this word, the same word, when we go to Genesis 2 where it says the sons of God took the daughters of men. And so we'll deal with that too. It's the same word. So I'm going to talk about a little bit that word. Then I also want to uh, fill in a couple blanks that I didn't cover on the difference between the name of Cain's son, which on the, the genealogy in chapter 4, we, we pronounce it Enoch in our English language, but it's really Kanok, Kanok in the, in the Hebrew. And that's the same name as in the line from Seth, the seventh generation Enoch that uh, was taken to heaven alive. So you have a, a similar name in Cain's line, who was Cain's son, to the seventh son, seventh line in the Seth line. And so, but then you also have, because it creates a little confusion, the son of Seth in, the, in chapter 5 of genealogy, his name is Enosh. Enosh, and it looks similar, but it's pronounced differently. 
It doesn't have the kahed at the beginning. It has the olive as the first letter. So anyway, we'll talk more about those, those descendants. And then when I get into chapter 6, we'll talk about this issue of the sons of God and the daughters of men. And, and then the, the term Nephilim that comes in Genesis 6-4. Okay, so let's uh, let's just talk about that word, which will set up chapter six as well. Took, and, and again, I've, I've told you in my NIV translation, it translates it as married. It does the same thing in chapter six, translating this word in Hebrew to married, and that's a very loose <laughs> loose <laughs> term. Look, it's uh, the Lamed, the Quoth, and the Kehet, uh, uh, three, three characters. It kind of has a guttural sound, and it literally means, it has several different meanings, but the ones that I think are more, most relative to the situation with Lamech, Lamech in the line of Cain, as well as what was happening in the days before the flood. And that's, uh, but this word more properly means to seize, to carry away, to take, to buy, to fetch. And I would say it implies a sense of force with it. So overtaken, overtaken. And so it wasn't that the, the women involved here, the two wives of Lamech, necessarily voluntarily committed to the relationship. He, he took them. So, but it's also the first evidence of polygamy in the scripture too. And I don't, I don't believe God anywhere in his word approves of polygamy. Now, others did it, even who were righteous in the eyes of, of uh, God, essentially, because they believe God. I mean, David had several wives. Abraham had the wives, you know, so Jacob, two wives, and you know, so on. But I don't believe anywhere God authorizes polygamy. But, uh, but that can be debated. So, and it is by many people. Obviously, the Mormon religion <laughs> continues to um, practice it in some fashion. And you know, Islam does too, you know, so. Um, okay, so any, anyway, so that's covering that word. I just wanted to clarify that and, and clarify the, the two sons because when we get to the son of Seth, Enosh, we'll find at the end of chapter four here, the last line in chapter four. I'll just touch on it now and then we'll talk about it uh, in a little bit more. It says at that time, Seth also had a son and he named him Enosh. And that's this word here, Enosh. And it's different than Enoch. But Enosh, and then it goes on and says at that time, this is a very curious statement. So I, I want anybody's thoughts on this. I have my opinion. At that time, men began to call on the name of the Lord, Yahweh. This is the first evidence of men going directly to the Lord. Now, my opinion of that is, I think the introduction of prayer came in because talking to God, I mean, obviously Adam and Eve, we believe, probably talked to God in the Garden of Eden, you know, before the fall. Um, but after that, I don't think there's um, evidence of it. So here, um, it was some hundred and some years later, because Adam was 130 years old when he had Seth. So, and here you have Seth having a son. So you're down the road 200 years after creation. So anyway, that's just a, another little interesting line that we'd probably just kind of overlook. I'm not sure I know what he's talking about here, but to me it sounds like men began to call on the name of the Lord. You know, you can say they actually used the name Yahweh, 
which in Hebrew is not even allowed. You know, that's do not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Lord is Yahweh. And so they take it that seriously. They won't even pronounce it in, in, in the Hebrew. And so they would say Adonai or some other word that refers to the personal God, Elohim, and so forth. So anyway, that's just a <clears throat> little background there. Uh, so I want to finish where we left off in the reading last week, because we left off basically with verse 22, because <clears throat> we talked about Nema, and I think that's the last thing I talked about, the possibility that Nema, uh, a descendant of Cain, um, I guess it would be a granddaughter of Cain, most likely, or somewhere, somewhere down the road. Um, Nema, you know, I, I kind of think Raymond's covered this in more detail in his studies, but I think there had to be somebody with the Nephilim seed that came through on the ark because the Nephilim were still evident on the earth after the flood, which is what it says in Genesis 6. So somehow that seed had to come through on the ark. And so we can debate whether it came obviously came through one of the daughters of man, so one of the wives. We don't know the name of Noah's wife, necessarily. Uh, some think it might be Noah's wife, but I, th I think it's more likely one of the son's wives, and mo the most likely suspect would be Ham's wife. So, so that's what, kind of where I left off last week with just giving my opinion on where that name may have, may have played a part. Uh, particularly as we read on uh, with the, with the Nephil Nephilim being on the earth even afterwards, after the, after the flood. And there, can I suggest something? Sure. Ada and Nema are the two women there. Right. And Ada's name goes on to uh, name some of the Arab or Islamic towns, we would say. Okay. And um, Nema is the, is the name of the only wife named of Solomon. So it has, has that connection yeah, yeah, remaining. So they, both, they both end up on the okay. other side. Thank you. So let me, let me read here uh, what Lamech, Lamech is the one that kind of started this with taking two wives, but he's talking about his two wives, talking to his two wives. He said to them, verse 23, Ada and Zillah, listen to me. So he's demanding that they listen to him, wives of Lamech, Hear my words, I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. So apparently he's admitting to the fact that he's done just as his great grand, whatever great, great uh, level of grandfather with Cain did with his brother, but he killed a man. Um, and then verse 24 almost pridefully is saying to his wives, if Cain is avenged seven times, which is what was required by God, then Lamech 77 times. So it's even more important that uh, if, if vengeance comes upon Lamech, uh, that it be punished even to a greater extent. So that's what he's saying. It's kind of a very prideful statement. 77, I guess I was just thinking of 7 times 11, and um, the significance of that I haven't quite figured out, but it's a multiple time. You know, Jesus, Jesus said, forgive 70 times 7, and that'd be, you know, and so it's, um, there's some, some essence to, uh, to a greater, I mean, a, a far greater requirement. And so that's uh, kind of where that's left. And then I've read verse 25 before, which is where uh, Adam uh, lay with his wife again, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth, saying, God has granted me another child in place of Abel, since Cain killed him. And then this, this verse that I mentioned before, Seth also had a son, and he named him Enosh. 
Enos means mortal man, and uh, this Enoch, Enoch here means initiated or started. And so there's some essence of that. You know, Cain's first son and the city was named after him, and so there's a, perhaps a meaning in the initiated there on the Cain line. But we also know with Enoch, the seventh from Adam, who was taken to heaven alive by God, that's the first initiation of rapture, if you, if you will. And so God took him to heaven alive. We also believe as we move on here to some of the Apocrypha books, um, the book of Enoch happens to be an Apocrypha book, and I know Raymond studied it. I haven't read it completely, but just a few things in it gives more expansion on this concept of the Nephilim and so forth when we get to chapter 6 here. But, um, but I think it's important to, to realize that, uh, that there is other writings, other writings that expand our information, but for whatever reason, they were not put in the canon of Scripture. So we have to accept that, that God orchestrated that, and there was a reason for it when the, when the church fathers, you know, uh, made the determination through the Holy Spirit of what would go in the canon and what would be kept out. But I don't see anything wrong with looking at these Apocrypha books from a potential historical basis, an understanding, a broadening the understanding. So, so we do look at them, but we don't take it as God's inspired word. So that's the important thing to, to realize. So let me, let me talk about this, uh, this phrase, at, the t at that time, men began to call on the name of the Lord. <clears throat> and I, unless anybody else has other thoughts on this, what does that mean? Even, um, I think the, through, through the line of Seth, who was the replacement son for Abel, I think mankind began to realize that they could call upon the name of the Lord. They could go to the Lord, and I believe that's prayer. I believe they realized there was, there was prayer. I don't see any evidence that the line of Cain did that, but in the line uh, from, from Seth, it appears that that's, it's just kind of a, a byline. It's kind of just there. So <laughs> what do we do with it? Can I? Yeah. Go ahead, there's, please. There's yeah. some teaching that that word should be profane. Profane the name of oh really? Okay. But I disagree with that, and it's and, and the reason is because it's in the context of the verse. Mm -hmm. Seth, which is the line of the seed, right, was also born, and he called his name Enosh at that time. So, so Cain's line is going to die out, except for the wife All right. that came across. But but Cain's line dies out. Yep. So and that's chapter four is the end yeah. for them. I mean, name and you know, but when they when he named Seth. And he talks about uh, calling on the name of the Lord. I think it's a positive thing. Positive thing to yeah. carry on that line. Yeah. And have a relationship with yeah. the Creator. Yeah. So, okay. So anyway, we'll leave it. Leave it at that. Um, I think that's all I wanted to cover on. Uh, so let's. I, I'm not going to read through the rest of the genealogy in chapter five. I've done that before in the. In the innocence age, you know, talking about the each each generation, the ten generations from from Adam to uh, Noah, and how many years mo most of those are, they lived it was nearly a thousand years. Most of those generations, and so I believe the the death, the natural death that would come to man because of Adam and Eve taking of the fruit, was was not an instantaneous death, but it would come. And it would come in, t in a prophetic way in a thousand, nearly a, a, after living a thousand years for most of them. So, so anyway, we've, we've covered that. The only thing at the end of chapter 5, verse 32, sets up um, the account with Noah. So, and it tells us after Lamech, Lamech died... And as I've said, that um, if you calculate the years, he was 777 years old. That's Noah's father. 
it will take you right to the five years before the flood. So we, I mentioned it before, but it's worth repeating. The righteous line, if you want to call them that, the line through Seth, down to Noah, and Noah was found to be the only one righteous in his, his day. And I think God had prepared the way that none of the others that were in that righteous line before them would be alive when the flood came. And that was, was followed up. And so um, I think that's another act of grace on God's part to have to go through that experience of dying in a very gruesome way in the flood. And uh, so, but anyway, that, that kind of takes us to the end of the genealogy and sets up that Noah was 500 years old. So we can, uh, and he became the, and that's when he started ha had it, having his children at 500 years old, if you can imagine. <laughs> I can't keep, up, can't keep up with my... <laughs> so... <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure that makes it wise or Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a good question. So is there any indication, Gary, of whether, you know, I mean, if you start having children at 500, you know, you have to I mean, not that I know of. <laughs> if you go through, if you go through the genealogies, if you go through the genealogies, they they don't wait till 100 years. No. So it sounds like he purposely waited. There's something different about. Uh, there's a relationship with God there that I think was unique, and I think it, that it included the waiting, waiting for the children, you know, and. Uh, and so I think God, or Noah was prepared for what his role would be. And so to wait 500 years to have a family, and then uh, it's just... Uh, did your wife say, I know a person just like that, or know a person that, you know, uh, very quite a bit older, and he was in his 70s when he first had... Yeah. Well, it, it's, you know, that, it's not impossible, we know that. Time, you know, compared to their time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, so let's, uh, let's get ready to tackle ch chapter 6. And I'm just going to read the first two verses to start with, and then we'll, we'll kind of get into some of the broader discussion. I didn't get a chance to write everything on the board here. I, I wanted to with the, with the terms, the Hebrew terms and so forth, so I'll just talk about them. We'll also look at the book of Job. It'll be important to look at that because the terminology for sons of God is a, is a question because there's two basic concepts out there of what who, who the sons of God and who the daughters of men were at that time so if you if you lean towards and that's where I would say I am and fairly strongly lean towards uh, the Nephilim came from this um, what would you call a corrupt relationship between fallen angels and human beings so it, which brought about these strange characters called Nephilim and I believe the Nephilim did not have a soul to be saved that's my personal opinion so so they were to be destroyed yes Kathy. So Gary along those lines if you're thinking that that any of the children born would they also not be able to be saved that had Neph yeah. Nephilim seed in them we, we can't be fully judgmental, but it would seem any any of that, you know, would be very much a danger. The, the name Nephilim means to fall. Fallen. So Eam is, is, is yeah. all of them. Yeah. Plural. So right. It's plural. the Nephilim were born without being able to, they were like, almost like animals. Yeah. 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 And, and it does seem to relate to the fallen angels. I mean, as we've talked about Lucifer, where Lucifer came from, and, and uh, the f fallen angels that went against God, rebelled against God, and God threw them out of heaven. And so they had to go somewhere. And so 
something happened in this period. I think the book of Enoch, which is an apocrypha book, but seems to relate that this started happening in the, in the era of Jared. And Jared was the, on the genealogy, the sixth, the sixth from Adam, and he would have been the father of Enoch. So I believe part of the reason why Enoch may have been taken by God was as a righteous man to get him out of here, out of that situation, because the Nephilim would become more and more corrupt and evident on the earth and multiply and would lead ultimately to the flood being necessary by God. So that, that's just my thought on it. I, I think it makes sense that the Nephilim <clears throat> didn't exist until this relationship came about, and that had to come about at a certain time. And so the book of Enoch seems to imply that, it's, that it was in the, in the days of Jared on the genealogy. So anyway, um, okay, so let me, let me read these first two verses, and then we'll get into it and see how far we get this morning. When men began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, so it, the sons of God, we'll talk about that terminology, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they married any of them they chose. Again, it seems like they're taking them, <laughs> you know, by force. Yeah, they, so they were, these angels They were able to procreate in their form. That's what well, it appeared. We know that happened because if you take, like, when God came down and saw Abraham, he, there was two men with him. Yep. Yeah. So, so now the question is, well, they look like men, do they, can they <laughs> act like men? And the answer is yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and by the way, in the Hebrew, that word is took. And they took yeah. as their wives. Right, yeah. That's, yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's the same word as up here with Lamech. And it's just this word, Lecoq, and uh, literally means to seize or carry away. Uh, How do you pronounce that Hebrew word? Kind of thing. How do you pronounce it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I, thought you, I just didn't hear what you said. Just say Cook. <laughs> it's, kind of a, it's kind of a guttural sound. Lecoq. Lecoq. Because the... The kahet at the end is, a, is like you're clearing your throat. It's really almost a And then you have the, uh, the cloth, the cloth which is the Q sound, is before that. And it's kind of, it the cloth, the cloth is a picture of the back of the head, the cloth, cloth of your head. And so it, it's also pronounced with a Q sound, cloth, cloth, cloth. So, so put those two characters together and try to pronounce them. So, I, <laughs> yeah, yeah. so, yeah. So, yeah. So that's that's what we're talking about. So now let's delve in because I have on the outline, as you know, seen um, who are the sons of God, who are the daughters of men. Let's start with the daughters of men because I think that's pretty straightforward. I think those are literal human beings, females, w women, born from two, result of two parents, and, uh, but more likely than not, we're in the line of Cain. It doesn't necessarily have to be totally, but it, it seems that's where it probably came from. And so those daughters of men through those generations, whether it's seven or how many generations until this started happening on the earth sometime before the flood, um, they were doing, they were being taken by these sons of men. Now, those that don't believe in the fallen angel, the Nephilim account, just think those were in the line of Cain, were sons, men, human beings, in the line of Cain. And they were taking their wives and procreating, and therefore you create people that are violent and you know corrupt on the earth. To me, that just doesn't make sense with a lot of other things that seem to be in this account. So that's why I 
I think that's trying to simplify it and not deal with the difficulty of this very strange thing happening. Because I think most, most of us would wonder about Dave's question. Can angels procreate? Can angels create offspring? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, th I, think, I think they could. It's not their purpose. They were not to do that. But they did a lot of things. <laughs> this, this group of, of fallen angels, the, the demonic spirits that followed Lucifer after Lucifer fell in heaven, as I see it. So, Okay, so let's, so the daughters of men is pretty simple. Um, that is in the Hebrew, let's see if I have, have it here on my, my sheet. The word for daughter is bath, B-A-T-H, like bath, but bath is just bait and, and the tav, so the second character of the Hebrew alphabet and the last character of the Hebrew alphabet. So that's daughters. And then the word for men here is Adam. So that seems to imply the first man created, you know, Adam. So they're descendants in some form of Adam. And of course the descendant, the Cain, descendants of Cain also came from Adam. And so to me, I just, I just define it as human women. So I think the daughters of, of men are human women. So now let's go to the, the more interesting one, which are the sons of God. Because we know that Adam was a son of God, right? I mean, we, we would refer to Adam because he was created by God and made a son of God. He was directly made by God. That's the key. Directly made by God, yeah. And so, but we also speculate, which I don't think is a big jump, that God also personally created the angels, the original angels in, in the... Uh, age past, let's call it what I talked about in the age of innocence, before the before Genesis 1-2. Anyway, um, so and we have some evidence of this and we can let, let, let's do it. I think we can I won't spend a lot of time on it but if we go to the book of Job let's look at Job chapter 1 verse 6, just to give the, give the starting point, because this this is really referring to, with, the, with Job going through the struggles he went through in his life, <clears throat> Job's first test, Job chapter 1, verse 6, and what's happening here, it's in the throne room of heaven, it's uh, a council of God is taking place, and, uh, and it says in verse 6, one day the angels... But it's really, it's really the term um, for uh, the sons of God, the same, the same word. Let me, let me give it to you. I don't have it on the board. Ben, Ben is the Hebrew word for son. And so if you put a, a yod at the end of it, it's just bait, noon, and then a yod at the end, which would make it plural, I believe. So Ben made plural as sons, and then God here is Elohim. Elohim is the God that's referred to in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God, Elohim. And Elohim is a plural God, you know, it's, which I believe indicates the triune God who created everything, the heavens and the earth. But that's who's being referred to here. The sons, Ben, Beni, uh, of Elohim. It's not of the Lord, but it's of Elohim, which was the first word in the Bible used for God. Gary? Yes? In my Bible, it says now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also. Yeah, your King James would have sons of God. Not yeah, not angels. <clears throat> and, and so, um, you know, some, some would uh, just liberally, depending on their, their attitude towards this, uh, that they would, well, it does, it does say, yeah, it says son, sons of God in the NIV too, so, yeah, so it is the sons of God, but I want to, I want to be sure in the book of Job that we understand that in ages past, 
that uh, God did call a council, or continues to, I believe, in some fashion, and the angels were present before the Lord, and Satan was there. Verse 6, one day the angels came to, to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. So he's there. The enemy is there. So he's going to call upon the counsel of God to give him authority over Job to test him. And most of us who, who know the story of Job know how much testing he went through. And, um, and God granted that. But the angels were there. So you have that one in... Um, Verse 6, and then you go to chapter 2, and you have it again, chapter 2, verse 1. On another day, the angels, or sons of God, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them to present himself before him. And the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? And so he's obviously been wandering around <laughs> over the earth, seeking whom he may devour, you know, so after the fall of Lucifer in heaven, even back in the time of Job, he was roaming the earth. And so, so I think with, with those two things in mind, and then we can go one other place in Job, which I always like to go to, is, is chapter 38, because this is God talking to Job directly. And you just can't <laughs> overlook, you know, the clarity of God <laughs> when Job was complaining about everything that was happening to him and so forth. And, uh, and so starting at verse 4, well, I'm going I'm to start at verse 1 just to set up the whole thing. We'll go through verse 7. Then the Lord answered Job out of the storm. He said, Who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. And here's God's word. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone? Now verse 7. While the morning stars sang together, and all the angels shouted for joy. So the picture here is that there were a certain group of what I would call angels that were called morning stars. And that those words in Hebrew are a little bokur, kakag, uh, again. So it, it's not the same term that angels have. And so, um, so it's, um, and, and really the angels here also are called the sons of, the sons of man, or sons of men, so, or sons of God, I'm sorry, sons of God. So it's, it's that term, ben Elohim. And so that's, that's what's being referred to here. So, so with that all in mind, let's go back to Genesis, because I think this, this makes more sense that the sons of God had an angelic form to them. And so the, the question is, what angels? And how, how did this all come about? And um, so then we have to go to the term Nephilim. Nephilim, which is in verse 4, 6, 4. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards when the sons of God went to the daughters of men and had children by them, they were the heroes of old, men of renown. That men of renown is an interesting term. I don't, again, I don't, didn't have time to put all this on the board, but it, it literally means Enosh, Enosh, the name of, uh, of uh, Seth's son, and Shem. Shem is the same word in Hebrew for name. So men of renown, or uh, those of, of renown. So 
It literally means Enosh, Shem. Just an interesting term, two names in the, in the ancestry that would fit there. So. so that's how they're described. Now, as Raymond mentioned earlier, there's another term here that's a, that's a core word of Nephilim. The base word is Nephel. Nephel, and so if you look that up in the Hebrew, um, it has the first three characters of Nephilim. That's the base word for in the Nephilim. And it just literally means a fallen one. So there's a sense that these are fallen angels. They're re rebels from heaven. They probably were the third of the angels, or the group of the third of the angels that were cast out of heaven by God when Lucifer was cast out of the throne room of God. So, Dave. So these sons of man, or of God, I mean, are still around. They didn't, like, yeah. turn to man and get lost in the flood. Their offspring did, but they're still around as evil some, spirits some, working with the devil. We'll see if, if we go to uh, Jude, the books in the New Testament, some of these fallen angels that, that you know, uh, got with women and had offspring, Nephilim were created, were cast into the prisons of hell and are being held there until the day of judgment. So some have never been released, but then there's others that still are out there, and that would be the demonic forces that we all deal with, whether we realize it or not. So they're still uh, very active, and they're active in this country. I hate to say it. Well, um, well, not related to them, yeah. So then that's who it's who it's talking about. So yeah, it's it's okay. it's the, the names the names are, you know, honorable names, I guess. Enosh would be honorable, and and so would Shem, you know, the the line of Noah through which Jesus would come, you know. So, but when it says they were the heroes, and I don't know what the term is there, I didn't look up that Hebrew word, but the heroes of old men of renown. So apparently they had created quite a reputation in those days. They were well, well known, became well known upon the earth. And of course, you have several generations there from Jared all the way to Noah that the Nephilim would have continued to increase. And so much of the corruption they on the earth. They be heroes of men, not heroes of God. Good. Obviously. Yep, good. Yep, exactly. Men looked to them, right. marveled at them. They were probably strong. You, you think of the image of Goliath in the New Testament, or in the you know, days of David. So Goliath, you think of Nimrod, possibly. And we'll talk about Nimrod when we go to the Tower of Babel situation. And he was, a, he was a descendant through Ham, you know, and, and probably was a Nephilim. You know, again, he, that's why I think Nema probably brought forward the seed on the ark, and her sons, perhaps at least one of them, Nimrod, became a true Nephilim. And he was in God's face, and so he had to be destroyed. So there's, there's a lot to this, but some of it becomes like folklore, you know, because you can't, you can't pin everything down precisely as to what God is telling us here. So we have to use other sources to get us to where we want to be, so in our understanding. I think we better stop there and we'll pick up on this uh, next week and, and prepare ourselves now for our time of worship. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time you've given us to be in your word, to be studying your word looking through the ages, from age to age, Lord, and, and your divine agenda that you have, have told us. You've told us what has happened in the past. It's in your word, and we can, we can study it. We can grow in our understanding. We can continue to try to search and, and ask for the guidance of the Holy Spirit to help us understand better as best we can. So we have the past history, and we, you've given us faith through Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit coming into us. And so we can believe you. 
and we do believe you. And so we believe your word. And so as we experience things in our lives, in our culture, where do we turn to for truth? We need to search for the truth and we need to start with your word. So thank you for giving us your word. Thank you even for the struggles and understanding much of your word or a lot of your word. But we ask for the guidance of your Holy Spirit to increase our understanding and particularly look at the things that are most important for what we are to know. So thank you for this time we've had and I thank you ahead of time for our time of worship. I pray that you'll prepare the people that are coming into this place for our time of worship that uh, your Holy Spirit will be moving among us in a way that will draw people to you, will, uh, that through the music, through the prayers, through the word that's shared, through the message that's given, through the time of communion, through every part of our service, Lord, that you will make it a personal experience for each person that comes into this place. So I thank you ahead of time for what you're going to do then. And I just give you all the praise and the honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen.